make sure when it comes to chest x-rays, and make sure you're stating this for your lab test out next week, by the way, that you are actually vocalizing that you need them to remove jewelry, like earrings and necklaces. Make sure they're removing all their clothes from the waist up, including the bras. And if your patient has larger breasts, we have to ask them to lift and spread their breasts to the side, which can be very uncomfortable to say once again, but there's an art to saying that. And uh, your patients will be okay with that if you word it the correct way. Like once again, no matter who you are, don't just walk up to the patient and say, hey, can you move your breasts all the way from my x-ray? That's not gonna end very well. What do we do? We explain why we're asking them to do that. So we can get a good quality image of your lungs. Can you please lift your breasts and spread them to the side? You're explaining why, calm voice, don't get red faced and embarrassed, because they can tell, but be confident in how you say it and that will go well. Of course, leads and other medical artifacts. I want to expand on that for a second, because leads, like I said, that's usually going to be your leads from EKGs that they leave on the patients. There's other medical artifacts, though, that we cannot remove, such as pacemakers and defibrillators. That's internal. We're not going to be able to get that artifact out of the body, but we're just going to document if the patient does have one. In case we have an incompetent radiologist who doesn't know what they're looking at, which does happen because we got a lot of residents out there that are learning. Um, also, there was another one that I told you guys at the end that we never removed. Y'all remember what that was called? Halter we with the heart halter monitor. monitor. We never remove halter monitors because that's going to mess up the read on that heart patient. You're going to have to go through all that trouble once again, and somebody's going to be hollering at you from the cardiac department. So don't do that. And that's the one that your wife has? Yes, yeah, she has to do that like once a year. And these are just a few of those examples we went through, guys. Of course, on the left. Now, you're going to see this a lot in your ICU patients. And one thing you want to get um, in the practice of doing, because we always want to ensure that we have top quality images by removing as many artifacts as possible. Now, obviously, on a critical patient, we're usually not gonna be able to remove most of this hardware off of their body. Some patients, you know, even touch them, they're gonna code. But as a general practice as a radiographer, you always wanna ask the nurse, is it okay if we remove any of this? Now, a lot of times in ICU, they'll say, absolutely not, it's gonna be too dangerous, but sometimes, if they're in better condition, they'll remove those leads for you and get all that equipment out of the way. But make sure you get in the practice of actually asking them, can we remove any of these off of the body so I can get a good x-ray of the lungs. Now, if you have to leave them, once again, what are we gonna do? We're gonna document that the nurse said we could not remove those leads. Blame the nurses. <laughs> Blame those nurses. That's gonna make me happy. But <laughs> it's usually their fault that you can't remove stuff anyway, but yeah. Huh? They, they do blame else. everybody else, so I said blame them right back. <laughs> of course, jewelry, once again, guys, notorious. And really those thin necklaces, guys, make sure that you, I mean, don't go peeking down someone's shirts, but make sure you reiterate, are you sure you got all your jewelry off? Did you have a necklace on, anything like that? Because that will show up and obscure those top areas of the lungs. And people will tell you yes, and they'll still show up. Of course, you have to repeat the x-ray, but just try to remind them, are you sure you got all your jewelry off? Oh, wait, I forgot I had a necklace. And I'll go take that off as well. Of course, hair, once again, get that hair out of the way. Get them to pull it up in a bun, hold it to the side. Sometimes you may have to actually hold the hair to the side as well as a tech to make sure it's not going to lung fill. Especially if they have any kind of jewelry or anything in their hair that's going to show up really bad. But hair itself is going to show up as an artifact. It'll look like little streaks on your x ray. So make sure that is up and out of the way. And of course, bras, and make sure we're talking about normal bras and sports bras, because what you're always going to hear when you say, take your bra off, they're going to say, well, I have a sports bra. Is that okay? No, you need to remove that as well, because the elastic in the sports bra will still show up. Well, I left it on my last x-ray. Well, ma'am, the technology is a lot more advanced. We have digital machines, and it will show up on that machine, so I do need to go ahead and remove that. See how there's a response to every little mm -hmm. counter there? Mm -hmm. And that is true because the digital machines are such high quality, we're gonna see all those little threads and fibers and elasticity in those sports bras. Used to, you could take an X-ray with them, it wasn't a big deal, but nowadays, all that clothing is gonna show up on an X-ray. So make sure you re reiterate that fact that you do need them to remove it to get a good quality X-ray of their lungs. Of course, piercings, guys, nipple rings. Make sure, once again, you say, did you remove all of your jewelry from the waist up. Do you have any piercings that need to be removed? You don't have to say, do you have nipple rings, but say, do you have any piercings that need to be removed? And they'll go ahead and remove that in the bathroom. If it does show up, once again, we're gonna document, and sometimes they'll say they can't remove it. Like, I just had these pierced, I can't remove them. In that case, document it, and make sure that you put that in your paperwork before you send it to the radiologist. And implants, of course, we cannot remove implants. That's not gonna end well. 
they are going to show up on x ray. Once again, mm -hmm. we're going to document that the patient has breast implants. And um, in case you have that incompetent radiologist, once again, that doesn't know what they're looking at, they're saying, What's these round things on the x ray? I've had that happen. What are these round things on the x-ray? Well, sir, they're breast implants. Oh, so that's what they look like. You'd be surprised. When I say you're going to know more than some of these doctors, you'll be surprised. Huh? Are they going to pass? How are they going to pass? They don't know. Uh, I have no idea. Now, this here is going to show you the importance of moving the breast out of the way, guys, because you have to be in practice of asking patients with larger breasts to do that. Right here. We'll show you a side-by-side -side comparison. This is the breast not moved out of the way. This is the breast moved aside. You see how it clears up the lungs. It does make a big difference. And if there is pathology found here, we don't want to obscure that in any way. So they could miss something on this x-ray if we sit in an x-ray looking like this versus this. And let's say there was some fusion down here. They'd be able to get a clearer di does, um, diagnosis of that particular pathology. And now they are side-by-side. -side. You can really see the difference there, right? It does make a difference. So we're all balancing the best quality images at all times, those doctors. For our patients and for our own reputations as well. Because they can tell who the good techs are versus the sloppy techs. A lot of sloppy techs don't care, but you should care, especially if you want to proceed and move up in this career field. Quality does matter. Those little things like that do help. You have a question? Yes, sir. So which is the breast in the extreme? Where's the breast? Right here. And then up out of the way, right here. See how it clears up the lungs? Yes, yes. All right, so for positioning. Now, just like with the soft tissue neck, guys, it is always preferred for a chest x-ray that we have them standing. Now, of course, not all of our patients will be able to stand, but preferably the ideal and optimal position will be standing. The reason being because a very popular condition that patients have is pleural effusion, which is what? What was pleural effusion? Yeah. Uh, Water in the lungs. Fluoro was liquid or water on the lungs, right? Because that is a very common condition, when we have a patient standing upright or seated upright, it's going to demonstrate the fluid levels the best versus lying down. Therefore, if we can get them sitting up in the bed, in a chair, or standing, that will always be the preferred way of doing a chest x-ray, specifically for fluid levels. Yes? So, good question. Last bullet point right here. If they cannot stand and we need to demonstrate fluid levels, that's what we're gonna do with the cubitus. Otherwise, standing is the ideal position. The cubitus is a backup plan when we can't have them stand. Because the fluid falls? Correct. Fluid falls and air rises. And non-ambulatory means what, guys? So we're not, 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 not able to walk around. So if you have a non-ambulatory patient, you're going to do that DQ position instead of stand up. So you're going to come to stand up. But ideally, once again, standing or upright is going to be your go-to, your best way to demonstrate those fluid levels on chest X-ray. All right. So for IR, collimation ration field size. Now, as a general rule, as an x-ray technologist, we're always going to want to use the smallest IR possible to show the anatomy. With that being said, most of your patients, though, will fit fine on a 14 by 17 facet because most people's chests are large enough to fit on that adequately. But as a general rule, once again, if we can use a smaller facet, we're going to opt to do that. What would be an example of that? Let's say I just did an x-ray on one of you guys. I'm going to use a 14 by 17 on everyone in this room. We're all adults. We all have larger chests. But if your five-year-old son comes in for an x-ray, am I still going to use a 14 by 17? No. No, because it's going to be much smaller. So I don't want to use maybe like a 10 by 12 or something much smaller. Why? Because that's for radiation protection. We want to deliver the least amount of radiation to the patient. The bigger the cassette, the more radiation we're going to end up delivering to that patient. So that's a protection rule. And of course, we're going to always collimate the, the field size to the anatomy of interest. Once again, if I'm using a 14 by 17, I have a large patient that fits fine. I can't collimate. They're all on that chest x-ray versus a very skinny or short person. If I have a very skinny or short person, I might have to collimate down a little bit, as you guys have done in the lab, to that particular pertinent anatomy. We say pertinent anatomy. Pertinent anatomy refers to the anatomy we want to see on the x-ray. Pertinent anatomy. You'll see that word used sometimes. 
And once again, that's all for protection purposes because we're always following ALARA as low as reasonably achievable with radiation. Because radiation can cause damage and long-term effects. Four chest x-rays, and this is a question. Really easy to remember, guys. Every, I'm gonna say it, every, capital E-V-E-R-Y, every chest x-ray you do for the entirety of your career should be done at 72 inch SID. And that's whether they're standing in the room, we're doing a portable, d cube lower dotic, anything to do with the chest will always be 72 inch SID. Now, why do we do this? Because we wanna minimize the magnification of the heart. The heart has natural OID because of our chest wall and or our backs. And if there's OID, the anatomy magnifies. So how do you reduce magnification? We increase the SID. That's a general rule for radiography period. If there's anything that's magnified on an x-ray, we can reduce magnification by increasing the SID. And chest x-rays in particular will always be done 72 inches. Now I'll say that because you're gonna get in the clinic next semester and you'll go on a portable x-ray rotation with the portable x-ray machines. You'll see a lot of techs doing those chest x-rays at 40 inches. They should still be doing that at 72. That's sloppy practice. We don't wanna do it at 40, we still wanna do 72 to get an optimized, beautiful quality image and reduce that OID properly. Please keep that in mind. Don't come back and say, well, Mr. Donahue, you know, John Smith does it at 40 and he says that's the only way to do it. I don't care what John Smith does. I don't care if he's gotten awards for doing it at 40. <laughs> The curriculum states we have to do it at 72, and that's what your registry will say as well. So do keep that in mind for all chest x-rays. So I put a big star on that for you. ID markers, of course, we need our anatomical markers on every image, no digital. Do we ever use digital for any reason? No. We do not. We must include either a right or left side marker on each image. And make sure we're placing that marker in the column and exposure field clear of the anatomy of interest. In other words, look at this image right here. Is this a good marker placement? No. no. Why not? It scares anatomy. We are covering up anatomy. Let's say they had a fracture on that humerus right there. We'd be covering it up inadvertently. We'd actually get in trouble for that if they found out they had a fracture. Therefore, what would be a better spot? Above the shoulders. And if you're doing a chest x-ray properly, how much light's above the shoulders? One and a half to two inches. One up to two inches, so you have space to put that marker in that light. Keep in mind, when you see the shadows on an x-ray, you know what I'm talking about with the shadows in the light? The shadow is what anatomy is gonna be on the x-ray. If it's away from the shadow, your marker won't be in the anatomy. If your marker is in the shadow, it's going to be in the anatomy. The shadow is a good guideline of where to put your marker as well. So always look to the shadow on that x-ray. Yes. So what do you mean by shadow, the light that is showing? So like, see how I'm doing a shadow right here? Imagine this is a chest x-ray. Yes, sir. You have your light on the bucky. Here's the light above the shoulders. This shadow is what's gonna show up on the x-ray. All the light above it's gonna be what's black on the x-ray, like this area right here. Therefore, you wanna put your marker out of the shadow. If it's in the shadow, it'll be in the anatomy. It's a good guideline to use. Yes. Oh, oh, far away. Wharton? Far away. It's very likely they are using a book called Bontrager and not Merrill's. And Bontrager has obsolete information in it. So yeah, this, she's not using Merrill's because I tried to see. It's probably Bontrager. <laughs> this is the gold standard, guys. I know for a fact from from inside resources I have with the ART, as well as actually having samples of their questions, they reference Merrill's, not on Jigger book. So it's unfortunate she's learned that, but I would tell her to make sure she knows digital markers are a big no-no. If that's on her registry, she would miss it. Yeah. You can tell her to come on over here. <laughs> we got plenty of room. All right, guys. Lead shield. Do we always shield our patients, yes or no? Yes. 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 Yeah. Only if it's not in the pertinent anatomy, right? Yeah. So for chest x-rays, we can always put the shields where? Behind them, on the, on the waist. 
If I'm standing AP, where's the shield go? Between the front and between On the anterior surface, right? What if I'm PA? What if I'm lateral? This side. This side, right? Make sure you turn that shield, guys. And I'm saying that because I've done these test outs on multiple students before in the past. And what do I see people make the mistake on? Either they don't put the shield on or they don't turn it. Unless, Unless you, 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 you turn that shield as you turn your patient. Very important. It's not going to do them any good if it's not actually blocking the x-rays. What was that um, thing you came up with, uh, Ms. Bonilla? You said months. It was like oh, C and stuff. That way we can remember. That little checklist? Yeah. I'll have to get her to text it to me because yeah. that was her idea. I can't remember off the top of my head. A little checklist you can put in your head. Like Trust in that, y'all. Oh, I do. Now for shielding guys, that's always going to be on your, this says, yeah, basically everybody, reproductive age and pediatric patients, but it doesn't say geriatric. I want you all to write geriatric as well, because as of now, per the law, we should still show our geriatric patients as well. And you'll have poor little granny come up to you and say, whoa, well, oh, honey, oh, honey, my ovaries are long gone. We're still going to shield you, Grandma, just because radiation could still, <laughs> still cause some damage. Oh, man. So they'll tell you that all the time. I've had all, oh, honey, my ovaries haven't been in use in 20 years. I'm like, well, you know, other stuff can be damaged as well. So we're going to go ahead and still cover you up. You know, just be safe. By the way, watch out for naked grandmas. You might meet Mr. White. <laughs> what? I've, had, I've had so many elderly ladies just like strip in the room. Uh, I okay, swear, she, like she might meet, meet Mr. Wright. Why do you ask me that? In Twenty so, years. Huh? <laughs> Even grandpas, like when I grandpas too. Yeah. Went to you'll, room. you'll ask them to go to the dressing room, and they just start stripping there in the room. Um, <laughs> had this had this older lady at my first job. I was like, okay, ma'am, here is your gown. Please remove all your clothing for your chest X-ray. You can go in this room right here. So I turn around to go do my paperwork, and I turn back around. She's butt naked. I'm like, ma'am. <laughs> the dressing room is right here. And she goes, oh, honey, you've seen it all before. <laughs> I said, man, please, please go to the dressing room. I didn't say it's going to well, that doesn't mean I want to see it now. So. <laughs> please go to the dressing room. So watch out, for your, watch out for your naked elderly people. They don't have any shame anymore. They feel like stripping. I was yeah. taking a patient from their room to x-ray. And I did my A day. I was like, I'm here taking off your x ray. <laughs> the only thing he heard was x ray because he was really old. Mm -hmm. And I like bent down to unplug the bed and everything. I looked back and he's just like butt naked with his arms. <laughs> <in> <laughs> oh, yeah. And the nurse walks in. She's like, what, should, what is going on? I'm like, I don't know what happened. And I'm like, I'm here to take you down. I'm not doing the x ray here. So yeah. Let me tell you all, if you're not used to seeing naked bodies, you're going to see a lot of naked bodies in the hospital. Some people just don't care when they're sick. I'm going all ages, so just um, shield your eyes as best you can. But you're you're to get numb to it. Honestly, you kind of get desensitized after a while, so don't worry about that. All right, other radiation protection measures, guys. Close collimation. Now you're going to see some sloppy text. Give me leave that light wide open. For an optimized radiograph, we always need some kind of evidence of collimation, and close collimation is a must to protect our patients properly. Of course, placing that lead shielding in the right spot without compromising the area of interest. In other words, if I'm doing a chest x-ray, I don't want that shield so high that it's cutting off half the chest, right? Mm -hmm. I'll make sure it's nice and out of the way. And technically, you can add this to your notes. Collimation and shielding go hand in hand because you want to try to collimate your shield out of the x-ray. Why? Because a shield absorbs extra x-rays. If it's absorbing extra x-rays, it's going to bring the quality of my image down if it's in a light field. So as a general practice, you want to bring that collimation down and not include the shield as much as possible. Yes? We also learned that if you include some of the shield, it's actually good because like it shows evidence. that you It depends. Something. It depends. So when we get to spinal work, for spines, you want to do that to absorb what we call scatter radiation. It's the thick area. It causes a lot of excess scatter of radiation, and it will absorb it. For something like a chest x-ray, you typically want to go ahead and clip that off because it will actually take away from the quality of the lungs. So we'll talk more about that in the next um, few semesters, but in general, try to, to collimate it off as much as possible. All right, also, you want to explain to your patients what's going on. Y'all been practicing this, practicing this in lab. You can't expect them to walk up that chest x-ray and know what's going on. Some of them have no clue. You know, okay, I'm taking an x-ray of your apices and costoferic angles. I want you to expire and inspire. They're going to say, what in the world is this person talking about? 
you want to explain with layman's terms, we're going to take a picture of your chest. I didn't say x-ray. We're going to take a picture of your chest. Everyone knows what a picture is. Mm -hmm. A lot of people, even if English is not their first language, we're going to take a picture of your chest. You're mining the actual actions, right? Picture of your chest. I want you to do what? I want you to breathe in and blow it out. Breathe in and hold it. Now, even if you're having trouble understanding me, what am I doing? I'm using my hands to breathe in blow out, breathe in, and hold it, don't move. See, I'm using my hands, mm -hmm. pantomime what you're doing, explain what you're doing, and make sure you get those respiration instructions correct. You'll repeat more chest x-rays for lack of inspiration, because a lot of techs are lazy, and they don't get their techs to do those two big deep breaths. You need to make sure they do the second deep inspiration to fully inflate the lungs, because for an optimal chest x-ray, and we'll talk about this more on the evaluation criteria, you need at minimum 10 ribs to show up within the lung field for an optimized chest x-ray. We achieve those 10 ribs by making sure we take that exposure on the second deep inspiration. That's critical. Fully inflate those lungs. Yes, sir. Well, this is a question about collimation. Uh -huh. um, I don't know if it just would make it too complicated, but you know, normally when you collimate, it's either it goes in on the side this way or it goes down this way. Mm -hmm. But it's never one stage and the other one moves up. They both move. Correct. So like, is it is it just because it would be too complicated to just have one stay Why there and then just... Basically, the technology is not quite there yet. Yeah. I'm sure in the, in the future they may have something like that, but for now it's always been both sides and top and bottom at the same time, yeah. yeah. But then the midpoint will be in the middle. It does keep the midpoint in the middle, yes. Mm -hmm. So, very good question. All right, so sometimes, very rarely, we will do different types of inspiration versus expiration x-rays. Um, why would we do expiration as opposed to inspiration? For these four reasons right here. Now, ideally, once again, we want to take those x-rays on the second inspiration, but if a patient has any of these four conditions, a doctor may request an expiration x-ray, which means that we're blowing the air out and taking the exposure. That's specifically for pneumothorax, measuring diaphragm movement, looking for a foreign body, or atelectasis. And what was atelectasis again? Collapsed um, lung. A collapsed lung, correct. For those four reasons, we may do a chest x-ray on expiration. But everything else should always be on inspiration. They will specify, yes. That's why we look at the little orders, little requisitions that we print out. Make sure you read those because that'll give you a lot of information on what to expect on your patients. Question. Yes. On the portable x rays, um, supposed to be set at 72, so do they, you supposed to use the measuring tape or? They should, they, yes. Okay. Good question. Do you not choose like the person? No, it's going to be random. We're going to randomly assign you guys. You're going to rotate with everybody and everywhere. So no, they're good at how do you choose a tech? Like, how do you know if they're good at teaching? How do you choose a tech and know they're good at teaching? Mm -hmm. You'll yeah, learn like, pretty quick. What if you know that, like, that tech, like, they're kind of sloppy and you're like, they're not going to teach this well, the right way? Well, they may be the only one that's there in that area. And you just have to oh, you know, okay. make notes of what they're doing wrong. Uh -huh. And, um, you know, as Dr. Black says, you're going to meet lions, tigers, and bears. Oh my. Oh my. <laughs> like the Wizard of Oz, but you know, we gotta learn to work with everybody. You're gonna see good text, you're gonna see bad text, you're gonna see happy text, you're gonna see grumpy text, but we have to learn harmoni to work harmoniously with everybody. And you're gonna learn that. You're gonna see what not to do and what to do in clinic. Yeah. I was gonna ask if we happen to see a tech that does a lot of things that we shouldn't do and we happen to document them, like what do we do with that? You do an eval at the end of your rotation that we get to see. And okay. we usually follow up with their managers okay. if there's bad behavior. So we ask you guys to be very honest and document what you're seeing and you do your evaluation at the end of each rotation. But we'll talk more about that next semester. That's a whole nother lecture worth, lecture worth of information. So bring the instructions guys, once again, Inspiration is critical to fully inflate those lungs, but also make sure you know how the diaphragm moves between inspiration and expiration. It's a really great picture if you want to take a picture of that. Uh, the diaphragm, remember, when we breathe in, when we inspire, your diaphragm flattens. 
people always get these mixed up. It flattens because we have to make room for the lungs to expand. The diaphragm's a muscle. When we blow the air out, we have the diaphragm contract. And why is it contract? To push the air out of the lungs. It's a muscle. So breathing in, it relaxes and flattens. Breathing out, it contracts and blows that air out. Write that down. Remember that, very important. And they're showing you a difference between the two right there, guys. On the left is an inspiration x-ray. On the right is an expiration x-ray. You can see a difference in how big the lungs are. So once again, we want to get a full analysis of the lungs. We can only do that if we get that x-ray on inspiration. And we want at least 10 ribs demonstrated within that lung fill. When I say 10 ribs, we have to actually count the ribs. And we're going to practice that on a few slides ahead of how to actually count those ribs to ensure that we have all 10 within the lung fill for a good optimal chest x-ray. There is a correct way and an incorrect way to count those ribs. I'm going to show you all because people mix this up all the time. This is not the first rib. This is the first rib. The first rib curves very sharply and makes a C-shape. Y'all see that? So if we're going to count these ribs properly, we're going to go one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. And the tenth rib is partially in the lungs, therefore this would be a good x-ray with good inspiration. Did y'all see how I counted that? One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. Get used to counting those ribs. We'll keep practicing that. It's very important to make sure you have an optimal, fully inflated lungs x-ray. Question? Sir, where you stop at 10, there's, what I see, there's another, another marking. What is that, sir? Below so, the test. This and the one below this. Like here? The one right below here. this, below, yeah. like this one. Yeah. That's another rib. That's the 11th rib. So you have 12 ribs. Yeah, but we only need 10 to show up in the lungs. Can you point to the one is this very sharp one up here. It's a very sharp C. So oh, that, that one. That's not one. People always think that's one. One is right here. If you look on the X-ray, I mean, I'm sorry, on Mr. Bones here. See how the first rib is very short and kind of like a C-shape mm -hmm. at the top? Yeah. Same as on the X-ray. Uh -huh. All right, let's start going through our actual projections of the chest and the lungs. So these are what we call our essential projections of the chest. Essential projections of the chest. That includes our PA, our lateral, our PA oblique, our AP oblique, then the AP and the AP axial view. We're going to go through each of these individually, and then we'll have some specialized views that we go over as well, like your DQs. Yes? And actually, pause your question for a second. I'll take this a second. We're going to take our first break. It's 9 o'clock. Take 10 minutes and get you some coffee, stretch. You got a lot more to hit today. Come back at 9 10. I'm sorry, what's your question? So, I'm going to be at the first day of the class.